Welcome you back to another episode of Black Soul Media. This is your host, King Heen, and we have a guest who, um, man, I've been wanting to work with Mel for a minute, man. <laughs> this dude, he's uh, just one of the hardest workers I know uh, from his work in commercials. He's working short films, including a short film with one of my other boys, Rodney. Um, you know, yeah. it was amazing to see, um, you know, the Fruit of Bears and what they do have done as far as the award winning, um, you. you know what I mean, is in the festival circuit uh, for short films. They, you know, Mel has just done many uh, roles within shows, TV shows, um, had great cameos as well as just like really holding it down. And um, man, I think his story and just the way he approaches his craft is going to make for such an engaging conversation. So with that, I just want to welcome Melvin Taylor on the Black Soul Media. Thank you, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Glad, happy, glad excuse me, glad and happy. There we go. <laughs> to be here with bro. you today. I was yeah. like, hey, well, let me get that out. Yo, yeah. most deaf, man. Thank, thanks for making the time. So, no problem. you know, I think we should probably start. We're going to get into your background and who, what made you the man you are today. But okay. it's fresh off the presses. So, like, let's talk about, you know, the launch that happened yesterday. So, as of today's recording, uh, Baldy launched yesterday. Yeah. Um, it's a campaign um, and a short film um, that you know you put together, and the campaign is actually crowd um, funding uh, to raise money to fund the campaign and yeah. fund the um, actual film, centering that around the strikes that are going on mm -hmm. and around labor. Mm -hmm. So, could you just kind of get into that for people and like why it was important to you and what it's about? Sure thing. Um, I want to check and see. It actually is like 24 hours ago uh, we launched it, so it's. It's kind of crazy that we already have like 30 percent of our budget and i'm just you know I'll, I'll get into everything else but i just want to off top say i'm super thankful to all of the folks that have supported all the folks that will support um and the continued support that uh my village has been able to give me um over the years because i, I know i've taken a lot of crazy turns to end up where i am now but um it's all starting to come together and um it's super exciting, but uh, what Baldy is about is, uh, is long story short, loosely based on my life. Loosely, I, I probably need to say tightly, based on my life. But um, it's it's just about losing your hair and the identity that you associate with that. I remember I was 20 in college, and uh, I'll never forget it. We was uh, taking a group picture, and I remember afterwards I saw the picture on Facebook. And I was like in the front. It was like one of the only black dudes in the picture, so it was easy for me to spot myself. And I'm looking in the front. And I was like, man, the sun is looking rather nice, bouncing off my forehead. Like, what's going on here? And then I had a time. My afro wasn't as big as yours, but uh, it was big nonetheless. And when I kind of like zoomed in on the picture, I was like, nah, like you, you got to be kidding me. Like, there's no way. And that's just slowly started happening. And I was doing everything to fight it from like. Uh, Rogaine to whatever herbal stuff you could find to like I'm not wearing no more hats I'm like getting low haircuts um, and something that you'll find uh, uh, in the film as well just like some of the other things that happened to me and in, in going through it and um, just kind of battled that for years until one day I kind of saw what um, there's a there's somebody that's that's really famous that did an old interview and this was before they became known as like the ball guy and um, I saw this interview and I was looking at them. They were like on national television. I was like, none of your friends told you your hair looked like that. Like, <laughs> nobody <laughs> let you know. Yo, when I tell you, I'm going to show you this picture later. <laughs> when I tell you they look insane, I was like, nah. Like, and nobody told you that. So I was like, is that how I look? <laughs> no, bro. No, can't do this. And I remember calling my dad that day and being like, dad, when I come back home in Chicago, we're going to go to the bathroom and you're just going to shave it off. And we just going to figure it out from there. Like, just teach me just everything it. I got to I gotta learn. I was like, I, it took me a while to get to that point. Um, being called Hatfish, going out in the middle of the summer with hats on. Like, I had my Neo stuff going on. I was like, Melvin, it's like 95 degrees outside. And I was like, yeah, my hat look good. Girl, <laughs> but, um, look, yeah, yeah, just, just the whole just the whole thing, whatever I could do to hide it. But after that, I just kind of started living in it uh, more and more as I do today. But, um Overall, we chose Seed and Spark because Seed and Spark is um, uh, a, a crowdfunding platform that's built by filmmakers for filmmakers, and um, it's a great way to be able to uh, not only receive some incentives if you're able to reach certain amounts, but 
for people to really see that you're serious about it because they have so many qualifications that you have to go through to be able to get your film on that platform. Like if I were to, and that's no offense to an Indiegogo or a Kickstarter or anybody else, uh, more often than not, they have things that are not associated with film. But okay. because uh, Seed and Spark is, hey, we're for filmmakers, by filmmakers, mm. they know certain elements that you need, whether that's your, your story, your log line, who's on your team, what your budget is, how many people you can reach out to already in your network, yada, yada. They know what goes into making a project. And unless you have all those elements together and have a thorough plan to be able to pull it off, then they're not going to approve your campaign. So I was so thankful yeah. when I got the, okay, like you're good to go and hit ignition whenever you want yeah. and go from there. And it was also something, um, I'll, I'll be quick with this part. It was also something that I wanted to do because with the strike going on, um, there's a lot of my friends that are just out of work. And while we we always joke and laugh out on set because we work in 15, 16, 17, 18 hour days um, that, you know, we always tired. Uh, the, the, the turnover, the turnaround is always rough on the bodies, mm. um, especially when you're working on a project for it could be as, up to a month. It could be up to six months. It could be a year. Um, and, you know, just all of that stress adds up. So you become really close with people and that closeness that you get with your coworkers turned family, you end up missing. And that's what I noticed that a lot of my friends right now were missing. Mm, and I wanted energy. to create, exactly. Like I wanted to create an opportunity to say like, yeah, like absolutely. Am I going to be able to write something that I can star in and act in and showcase that for sure. But I also want to be able to bring that togetherness that we're missing just so that way people can kind of feel good again about everything that's going on, especially going into the holiday season. Cause mm -hmm. it's, it's rough out here when you ain't worked since April and you like, bro, like, and we about to go to Christmas and then like, oh, excuse me, Thanksgiving and Christmas, like, I gotta have something good to happen I'm in my life. You, so, bro. yeah. Yo, much respect for the mission of it and uh, what you're doing. So, you know, with that said, I think that's a perfect segue for us to actually, um, you know, let people get a, a view of uh, Baldy, uh, the campaign. You know, what I'm saying the crowdfunding around it. Mm -hmm. So, one thing that Mel, <laughs> one thing that um, you know, Mel was too humble to talk about was, you know, that the fact that, you know, he was a writer, producer, um, and is starring in the film as well. So that's a perfect segue for us to check out the promotional campaign for Baldy. What up, world? My name is Melvin Taylor. I am the creator, writer, executive producer, and star of a new short film called Baldy. Now, you may have seen me in the movie. It's like, I don't know what to do. Like, should I call her? Should I text her? A TV show with the cockpit is locked from the inside. Someone's in there. A commercial. Each half of what I paid before or somewhere on YouTube. I'm a film and TV production assistant, an actor, as well as a writer. And today I'm here in front of you because we're gonna make a movie and I need your help to be able to do it. Now, this movie is gonna be about something I know more so than anybody else going bald. Before we get into why I'm making a movie about that, let's talk about why we're making a movie right now. As you know, the film and TV industry is shut down due to the WGA and SAG strikes, and rightfully so. That means that there are hundreds of thousands of people that are currently out of work. In light of that, I decided to develop one of my short films to the point where I'm here with you now. We want to show you that whether the studios give us the tools or not, we're going to find a way. I want everyone to be able to do something that they love, and this project is going to help the people on that team to be able to do so. Okay, so you understand why we're making a project right now. Next, you need to know who's going to make it with us because we need more than just me and you. Combined, we have over 50 years of film and TV experience. And this is the first of a couple projects we plan on putting together. Our director is Eddie Griffith, a proud DGA member that I met on the set of Bros the Movie. And he has a keen sense of where this story needs to go. Erin Trout is our DP, and she's a wizard at what she does. Our team of producers consists of some of the coolest people I've met. This group has not only worked on and completed several short films, but has racked up a number of awards for doing so. Not to mention, they've worked on productions like Creed 3, No Sudden Moves, Bros, Journal for Jordan, just like that. Westworld, City on a Hill, you, many, many more. One thing that was talked about in detail in mm -hmm. that video that you started to get into and that your director talked about um, was, you know, confidence and your identity. How difficult was it for you to navigate redefining yourself, you know what I mean, after transitioning from um, from having an afro to like embracing being bald? That's a, that's a really good question. I would say that the most difficult aspect of it, the most difficult part of it, and the part that a lot of people don't talk about that are going through it, because there are over 80 million people that deal with it um, in, in the world today. And um, 
is just losing that sense of confidence in yourself, that, that sense of you know who you are, you know how you're showing up in rooms, you know what your presence, your aura is. Like, and you, you know what I mean? Like when certain people walk in a room and they kind of have that, like they have it to them, they got that togetherness, they kind of got that gusto where it's like, okay, cool, they, they know who they are kind of thing. And when you're losing that, you're trying to mask it in so many other ways. Mm-hmm. And through that, you're just losing your sense of identity. And it was it was tough for a long time because I, you know, trying to go out to places and I would go out to clubs and my friends were like, all right, cool. We go on to such and such. I'm like, great. We get in line and the bouncer like, yeah, bro, you got to take that hat off. And now I'm like, hey, y'all, I'll see y'all later. Like, I'm going home. And they're like, yo, bro, what are you doing? I was like, not taking my hat off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, there were times where security wow. was like, yeah, I'll hold your hat. Ended up throwing it away. Or um, I'm trying to sneak it in there. And then they pull me out because I, I got my hat on in there and I'm not supposed to have it. Or um, times where I'm in there with no hat, and all of a sudden all the lights come on, and then the person that you dancing with turn around, and they just like, yo! And I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> yo! I'm surprised people right react like that. You know what I'm saying? Um, Look, man, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And what it, what it sounds like you're saying too is like part of wearing that hat, or part of other things that you did. Uh, was you figuring out how to get in your bag with your new look and your new aura? Mm-hmm. Um, so look, man, I'm I'm definitely looking forward to seeing that film myself. Thank you. Um, Thank definitely you. gonna Thank support you. the campaign as well. Um, so yeah, man, like that's a, a worthwhile mission. Uh, not just because it's an experience you went through, and like you said, 80 million people are going through it, but also yeah. because yeah. confidence and identity are um, evergreen subjects. Yes, you know what I'm saying. Yes, especially for people of color. Mm-hmm. So. Getting into your identity and your background, uh, born in Ohio, mm-hmm. um, but you know, as you told me, you've had your, you know, your triumphs, your falls, your heartbreaks. Mm-hmm. You know, as you eloquently put it in Chicago, how does um, that part of your identity play into, like, you know, your love for the arts? Like, that's a that's a good question. Um, I would say that part of my identity plays through everything that I do now, just from the creativeness that I had to store up for myself because when I was younger I didn't really start playing sports until like midway through grade school so all like growing up I was the kid that I'm playing Legos and building like super sophisticated architecture or I'm like reading front to back a Harry Potter book and then back to front to make sure I didn't miss anything so just really my imagination um, was just kind of fostering at that point in time and then um, I wouldn't say I had to like taper it down but when I got into sports I was then able to just kind of like reimagine it through the lens of sports and um, once I was in college and I was done playing basketball and I was done running track I was like okay like I've I've done it for a year and a half almost two years I think this is it for me now Um, and that was a whole crazy situation how that happened but when it was over with I was like okay that same imagination that same energy that same fervor that I had, like, where is it going to go? What am I going to do with it? And slowly but surely, like, it was through sports broadcasting where I was like, okay, I could do, like, the Stuart Scott thing and, like, get there. Um, and slowly bleeding its way into the arts um, through doing plays. Like, um, I honestly, I went to go see a really bad movie. And I don't like saying the movies are bad. Yeah, but yeah. I went to go objectively, see. Objectively, this drunk is trash. Yeah. Ob- <laughs> objectively, when I meet the star one day, I'm going to tell him he owed me $17. <laughs> so I went to see yeah. this movie and I was mad because I was like, this is like one of my favorite actors. And I was like, bro, <laughs> this movie is not it. Like, <laughs> what is this? What are you doing? And I was so mad that I remember a buddy of mine um, told me, you know, they're doing auditions for the school play. So I, I would drive back to, to school, everybody get out of my car. And uh, my friends look at me like, yo, are you coming inside? What you doing? I was like, I got to go take a drive for a minute. I just need to get this off my mind. <laughs> you and, flush that shit out. Yeah. <laughs> and as I'm going, I, something just tells me, like, just just pull up to the audition. And I was like, mm, I ain't finna do that. And then next thing you know, I drove and I'm like sitting in front of the building. And I was like, am I really about to do this? And then went in, nervous as hell, auditioned. But I ended up getting a lead role from it. And from there, I was like, wow. I kind of enjoy this. I really like it. And that imagination that I had when I was younger got to come back out through the characters that I played and the backstories that you have to build. And there's a lot of people that you meet that character the day that you start watching that movie or that show. But that actor has to build an entire backstory all the way leading up to 
page one so that they can understand what their motivations are, why they're happy, why they're sad, why they choose to do the things that they How do. How they show up, mm-hmm. you know, based upon all of their experiences and Exactly. How and, and to, to tie it into what we were talking about earlier, how are they going to show up in confidence, mm-hmm. right, as they walk into a room? And if you don't have that and you're just showing up like, okay, cool, this is me, well, that's when you start to get people that are like, all right, they play the same person in yeah. every role because they don't have that depth of what what did you build before getting into there. Most definitely, man. So to, to get into what you mentioned about sports, mm-hmm. um, man, I thought it was fascinating – when you know getting ready for this interview and talking to you, I thought it was really fascin- fascinating the way you related your journey in sports to your your journey um, as an actor and your identity as an actor. So staying with that theme of identity, um, you talked about how many people in your family on both sides were super skilled athletes. Man. You know what I'm saying? You were kind of the one, like you said, doing the architecture, reading the Harry Potter. And you know what I'm saying, do what you have to do. You were nice too. You did what you I was. Had to I do. was. I was cool. I was alright. I was nice. alright. You know, I could. I could. I can hit some threes. I can play some defense. <laughs> right, right. I can catch some passes. I can throw a couple. I can play a little bit of corner and all of that. But right. it was like, you know, it's a drop in the bucket compared to everybody else in the family being like, well, I got this scoring record, or I did this, or I did that. And I was just like, yeah, <laughs> dog. No, nah, for sure, man. But um, you, you, what was so fascinating to me is how you said you took the discipline and the principles and the competitiveness that you learned in sports and translated that to acting Mm -hmm. um and then there's some other sports things i want to talk about as far as acting but Mm -hmm. could you get into that for me like translating that discipline from sports to acting sure it was um one of the idols that i had in sports rest in peace kobe was um just from the sheer um amount of work that he would put into being as great as he was like i remember being in high school Mm -hmm. and at the time i was like i'm trying to improve in all of this but I'm only spending X amount of time on it and just kind of like learning. At the time, I was like, this man is getting up at 3 a.m. every day to start his workout. Then he goes back, making sure he's taking his kids to school, then goes and works out again. Then he's going back home, picking them up from school, spending some time with them, then going to do one more and then coming back home and just getting himself together to go to bed immediately. Ooh, and man. imagine if he was doing that over an entire summer. Yeah. Meanwhile, you have one person that they might work out one time a day for an extended period of time, or you might even get two times a day. He's doing that every day for five to seven days ranging every week during the summer. So if these two people are competing, by the time three summers pass, where is he going to be versus where this other person is? And as I started to dive into that, I really just found my, like, that's going to be my calling card, just working as hard as I can, as often as I can, as much as I can, because I don't want to do something if I don't believe I can be not just good in it, but great in it. And taking that same passion, that same discipline that I had after I was like, man, I'm disappointed that I'm not going to have the professional athletic career that I wanted to have, um, taking that and being able to translate that into being in media and then more specifically, like when I was doing YouTube and radio, and then even now so into acting, is me saying, like, I want to be good at this. I want to be great at it. So let me take that same passion. Let me go to these acting classes. Let me take some online classes. Let me read some books. Let me write my own material, you know, so that way I'm not just waiting on an opportunity. It's like when you're acting, you're almost like, it's a tryout every time you're going for an audition. And at a certain point in time, you got to decide, am I going to be like AAU and just make my own team or am I going to continually try and make all these other teams? And while that's not a bad thing, if I'm not doing anything else in the meantime, then I'm I'm going to be the guy that's here. Meanwhile, the person that's over here is just going to keep Getting going. Richer. So I have to do something to continually make myself better because if I'm not, then I'm going to feel like I'm failing. And that was the same feeling that I had when I was like around some of my family yeah. and they were just, you know, they all got in the wars doing this, doing that. And I'm like, I got like straight A's. And they're like, yo, that's good. Yeah, right. But you ain't score 45, though. And I'm like, and, and you know, my bad, yeah. I'm joking. But yeah. at the same time, it was, it was that, vision. yeah, it was, it, it just, it, it was what it was. Yeah. And I never took too much offense to it. I was just like, that's not me. But when I do figure it out, I swear I'm going to let all y'all. I'm a dominant. I swear <laughs> I'm about to murder this <laughs> when I get to I'm a it. Dominant. So that's yeah. a fact, bro. Riveting stuff. So do you enjoy that competitive part of it? Like, 
um, in terms of the auditions? Like every time it's a comp, do you like that? I do. Yeah, I do. And it was very difficult at first because I was just like, man, like what, what is it that makes this so difficult? And it's the same thing I talked about earlier in terms of building that backstory, even mm-hmm. for um, something that like. I had an audition I got to do as soon as I get home. Let's do it like 6 a.m. in the morning tomorrow. Mm. So it's like just quickly getting into it and turning around like, okay, how good can I make this audition? Like how great can I be in this? What can I show that's going to leap off of the video and catch their attention to be like, I need him in my project. Oh, it's yes. the same way as when a coach is watching some game film and he looking and he like, that 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 boy, that girl know exactly what they we need them on our team. Yeah. Right? Or how Dion in the portal, like, I ain't hard to find. Like, <laughs> just send me send me the tape, but if you're good, I'm gonna find same situation yeah. where like I need my tape to jump off and catch somebody's attention so that way they're like, I need Melvin in my project. Most deaf, man. And that takes going the extra mile. Um, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of actors, some of the most inspiring um stories of just courage, discipline and hard work, dedication come from actors like I even think of Heath Ledger and how, mm-hmm. you know, getting mm-hmm. into character for the Joker. He would like, um, you know, keep a journal and just write evil thoughts that the Joker would have leading up to the film for like months on end. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even Denzel, how when he went to uh, play Malcolm X, he actually got off of red meat for a year. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually found that out recently um, and, you know, kind of lived a bit of more of a Muslim uh, lifestyle, lifestyle to really so identify can, like, with really it. identify with the character yeah. and getting get into um you know the energy of malcolm x and there were certain times uh where the you know spike lee talks about he just kind of started to go off script but mm-hmm. it was incredible and it was coming from a genuine place because yeah. he put himself in that mindset yeah so always makes a huge difference and you can tell when an actor is like all right i want to make this character fit me or I want to see what what would this character like? I'm actually curious. Absolutely. Like, what would this character eat for breakfast? You know yep. what I'm saying? Like, yeah. or if this character like, if X, Y, and Z happened throughout the day, mm-hmm. if I'm staying genuine and true to the character, regardless of how it's going to make me look or how how it's going to make me feel, what is this character actually like? What are they actually going to do? Yep. How are they going to show up? Yeah. Like we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. So, getting back to the sports metaphor and how you relate that to acting. Man, another thing that stood out to me during our conversation uh, was where you talked about your different qualities as an actor that make you great. So we'll talk about, you know, your comedic relief and your uh, your relatability in a sec. Mm-hmm. But the first one I wanted to start with was you described yourself almost like a QB um, when you're acting, who you set your, um, your, your fellow actors and actresses up to like shine, to like look as best as they can. Talk about that, because I've never heard it described that way. Uh, no problem. Um, I look at it the same way. It comes from, like, when, you know, you're playing sports and you're playing, like, defense or you're playing receiver or whatever the case may be. Everybody has something that they have to do. Mm-hmm. And if you go off script, you run the wrong route, you miss the you miss the read, it's going to collapse everything. And it could lead to a score, a touchdown, whatever the case may be. And it's the same thing that I was – I used to – I used to coach like little little kids from like ages three to seven. Some of them are in college now playing. And it's the same thing that I would tell them. Like there's a togetherness that you have to have and you have to be disciplined enough to know um, what's going to be coming next. Right. And it's the same thing as when I got older and I saw, OK, if I'm more specifically in the sketch and improv scene, when I started doing it at UCB and the Magnet Theater, whenever I'm in a scene with someone, we if we both aren't shining then it's not going to work the Mm -hmm. only way for us both to be able to do that the only way for the team to be able to look good is everybody has to do what they have to do so if that means that i can really sell what's going on with me or i can do my job as best as i can then that's going to set you up for even more success for you to knock it out the park so if i can like I'll say uh i'll say a joke here and i know that you i I know that we're on the same page like because with improv you got to be on the same page with somebody. Like, yeah, no people. offense to a lot of improv, improvisation people, improvisation folks, improv folks out there. But um, if y'all like watch a lot of Friends, yeah. I'm not. We can't improv together because I don't know that. But if we're <laughs> yeah. doing the Fresh Prince, or if we're doing Martin, or the Jamie Foxx show, or something like that, cool. I can I can play with you. So okay. the folks that Culturally. exactly okay. the folks that I am on the same page with, 
if I'm making a reference to one of those shows, yeah. then I know if I we on the same page and I know that I'm about to do this and you're going to be able to knock it out the park, then I'm absolutely about to do that because now we're able to build such a cohesion that we're like peanut butter and jelly. We just go. It's the same way when I'm in um, an acting scene now is that I want to set up my partner to be as good as they can in this scene because that's going to make both of us shine. Like if somebody's going to look at the scene, there's no way that you're only going to look at one person. You're looking at the whole thing. And even if you are looking at that one person, you're doing it subconsciously. You're not even noticing that this other person is helping them to get there by taking the attention off themselves and putting it onto that person. It's the same thing that I want to do in all my acting scenes and everything I do on stage and sketch and improv. It's just let me be this character, but let me be it so well that it just feels natural to life. It feels natural to what you would see every day. So that way, everything else in the world you can experience as it's happening in the movie. Most definitely. So getting into your background in improv as well, um, one of the qualities that uh, you said makes you uh, great at acting is your relatability also. Mm -hmm. And because you have a background in improv, you're used to putting yourself in a in a mindset um, and you're used to rolling with the punches. Yeah. And it makes you more relatable because you're um, rolling with the punches just like a regular person would versus being so strict about what the character, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, is mm -hmm. or isn't. So was improv challenging for you when you first started? Did it come natural to you? Like what was it like when you, um, as many actors and actresses do kind of hit that wall when you first started? Mm -hmm. It was, um, it initially was challenging just because you have to, learn the rules of how it works mm. and the the primary rule is you have to say yes and it's something that you'll hear everybody that does improv say and yeah. it's you don't say no because if you say no you're killing the whole vibe you're killing the whole scene yeah. and now the audience is going to be like oh so like what's going to happen next and, 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 exactly so you always have to we're, we're taking it one step further right. how can we make it more crazy how can we make it more eccentric more fun more exciting and being able to do that um, in all aspects and everything that you're doing is what can help propel you forward. And that's what I use all the time is that, OK, like I'm not saying if, if I'm looking at this specific scene that I'm acting in, I'm not saying no to this scene. I'm saying yes. And what can I do? Maybe me and my co-star are sitting here at uh, dinner where we're, ha we're at table having a dinner. And all right, my tone may be this way. Maybe in the next scene I might try is where I'm kind of excited. But then they say something and then I just shut down. So now it's how are they going to respond to that in their same way as their character? Mm -hmm. What's their is their character gonna notice that? Or is their character like, hey, like is is everything cool? Like, do we need to pause the scene? Like, no, play with it right, for a right. little bit. And being able to have that practice, that experience, those conversations with people early on enough to let them know, you know, we can try things and figure it out to see what works best. As long as you have that backstory in that character, now you're going to understand, well, if I'm this person and this person, this is how they respond. If this is how this happens in the situation, then this is how they're going to be A, B, or C. They won't yeah. be D, E, or F. Okay. So it's a lot of it, it. And it goes back to being able to put in that work. So that way, when you get to those moments, you can respond quickly and respond the way in which um you're supposed to so that it comes out natural and good for everybody yeah and i hope that makes sense it I know makes I'm all perfect over the place. sense um you know you know i find acting fascinating man so just um the improv part of it to me is also just a lesson in being flexible mm -hmm. and a lesson in being adaptable and rolling with the punches because i think of all the different directions that you could take your improv and it's almost like like i think of it almost like um wrangling you know what I'm saying? Like a bull, like, or, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Or even like driving a car, like you're, you're getting into the car, but it's already moving, but you're trying to get it on the one road yeah. so yeah. that now we're all on the same page. The turns and everything could change. Yeah, man, change listen, direction and it will. Quick, too. And it will. But at least mm -hmm. now I'm behind the wheel and I got the audience along with me. So exactly. now they're in the car with me. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, man, it's a skill that I have just mad respect for. Um, so, and I know it takes just a lot. To, um, to to build that muscle, it does, and not to not to cut you off. No. I'm I'm thankful for the time that I was able to have it, and that it helped me to become 
where I am now. And I always love like going and seeing my friends that are, you know, just because of work schedules and working on set 15, 18 hour days, I can't do it as much as I want to yeah. anymore. But being able to see the people that I pseudo started with or were like a little bit ahead of me, a little bit behind me and go to their shows and just how much better they are now is just so crazy and it's so cool to see. I was recently at a show by a group called Brandon S- Branded Silk that my guy Jeff Kitt is a part of and just seeing like he's on stage with people that were that have been on like Netflix and whatnot mm. in terms of like uh, production value and shows they've been in and when I tell you he's fitting in seamlessly and just doing this that and the other and seeing all my other friends be able to do the same thing is just like y'all we're we're there we're right there yeah, we just gotta we just gotta keep going yeah Cause we man. can because I can see it so you just gotta stay on the path man. yeah man. it's always great to get that affirmation that confirmation mm-hmm. every once in a while that I'm on the right path and we're as a village and as a collective on yeah. the right path yeah we just gotta keep and that's the most difficult part is putting in that work every day and keeping yourself healthy while you do it mm-hmm. and then getting to the next day and keeping everyone around you as healthy as you can and being supportive but yeah. it really is as yeah. simple as that it's just you know real life gets complicated so it's always a great thing to see knowing that you're on the right path mm-hmm. um getting back uh to your experiences in acting yeah um you've had so many versatile um experiences from working with short films uh commercials feature length films um you know what i mean just plays um I, have you done musicals as well uh, I, I did some musicals like back in the day. Yeah, I mean, I mean, minutes, but, you, yeah. So yeah. you've done pretty much every type of um, acting. Mm-hmm. What is the most challenging one to you? And what's your favorite? They may be the same, they may not. Oh, that's a great question. Um, I love sketch comedy just because you, you, you're just making people laugh. And yeah. it's, a, it's a branch off from um, improv. I, I love improv too, but improv is so much more close related to stand up and it scares me a little bit because I'm like you just you just gotta go yeah. and I, I'm only scared a little bit of improv right now because I haven't done it in so long stand up comedy I'm like no nah, I'm not I can't do that like can my hats off to anybody that can because that's that's tough just to stand there and just be like I'm gonna just tell y'all stuff and make y'all laugh but um the most difficult um slash I'm gonna say most challenging is always doing plays hmm. because in everything, in almost everything else, you know, sketch and improv, you can't stop. Improv, somebody can hop in and help you out. Sketch, maybe if you got enough good improvisers there, then they can do that too. But um, with plays, if you don't know them 75 pages, yeah, it's, it's a wrap. A wrap. <laughs> it's a wrap. <laughs> and and the, not at all. And going back to that yeah. first play, the one that I got the lead role in, I remember when we had you to do our tech show. Was? It was called, called Macomb 19. 19- 64. Okay. Uh, it was basically about an uh, interracial relationship in Macomb, Mississippi in 1964. Mm. And uh, it was it was it was a really good play. Um, but nonetheless, I remember doing our tech rehearsal and the first moment that I get out there, I'm going to say my line and I froze because I was just like, oh my God, this is real. Now. I'm doing the video. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. And my co star is looking at me like, do not do this. Don't say, <laughs> say your line Jeez. right now. And I'm looking at her like, oh, and then it came to me. I was like, oh, my bad. Blah, 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 blah. And said it. And then eventually got off. And I was on backstage like, oh my God. Okay, cool. All right. <laughs> so it was we like got you it. just punched through something right there. It's, like, man, it's like um, I related yeah. to uh, the same way as, and all the Hoopers are going to know this and know exactly what I'm talking about. You get them pregame jitters. And then first time you touch the ball, then you're like, okay, I'm good. Um, I'm now I'm just I'm home. I'm just playing yeah. kind of thing. It was similar kind of thing. But I say all that to say in plays, if you don't know those lines, then you're literally screwing up the rest of the company because they can't do anything about it. Um, you know, acting in uh, TV and film, which is more of what I want to do at this point, is a lot of fun just because there's so many different avenues that you can take it. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I would say those are those are my answers. Plays are, man, I give it to them Broadway actors. Boy, man. it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. yeah, it's a it's a lot of pressure, like you said. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of pressure. Um, mm-hmm. And musicals as well. Like, don't I just haven't done one in a while? But to be able to 
act and sing and sometimes dance yeah. and be. <laughs> Come on now. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Man. It's ridiculous. There's so many talented people out there. Yeah, man. Um, and I, I love that your career has been so multifaceted so far that you have experience in each of those areas. So does being someone who's primarily an actor, um, do you believe that, you know what, let's ask it this way. Being someone who's primarily an actor, how does that change the way you write? That's a good question. Um, how does it change the how way How does it impact the way you write for you? Um, I try to take myself out of it as much as possible mm -hmm. and just go with where the story is pushing me because I know that through writing what comes out and then the revising process, I'll get it to a point to where um, it's either going to be something that's comfortable for me to play or something that's going to be challenging, but nonetheless, I'm going to be able to have fun with it. I, I don't really want to write things that, let me take a step back. I don't really want to write things too much more with me specifically in mind. Right. I want it to be any other person just so that way, let me make a good character first. And now what can I attribute myself to that character? Mm -hmm. And now if I can change things to still like, make sure that character is rock solid as who they are, then great. But if I can't do that character justice, then I'm not going to try and make that story for myself. I'm going to try and make it for somebody else. Like there's a very mm -hmm. first short film that I wrote. Um, while it's also kind of loosely based on experiences that I had, I got to a point in time where I was like, I don't believe this character is me anymore, so I wouldn't play this. But I would gladly be like, I wrote this story. Somebody wants to make this, somebody else wants to star in it, somebody else wants to direct it and produce it, and so on and so forth, I'll be happy, glad to be on board with that. But if I can't see myself as that, mm. then I don't want to do it. Um, yeah, so yeah. The, that um, more so describes characters that you may or may not play yourself like you've written. But just knowing the grind of acting and what it takes, mm. how does that change the way that you write other people's characters also? Um, I would say... The way in which it changes how I write other people's characters is that I want to give them a lot to play with. I want to give people um, a good amount to be able to get a feel for who their character is, what their world is, and what makes them tick. Mm -hmm. Because from there, going back to this again, right, um, people are able to build up who this person is. And now when we get to set, um, we've already had a strong relationship through the rehearsals or uh, through conversations, um, through um, auditions and so on and so forth about what this character entails. And then I get to see how did they piece it together and does this fit what I had in my head, which you know goes back to that original audition process where if you don't fit what that person has in their head, then you're not going to get right. the role. And right. that's, that's some of the competitive part about it, but that also is what makes it fun on – the acting side, but also on the, on the writing side, because I'm giving you an entire world to play with. It goes back to those Legos. I'm giving you, here's a whole NBA arena that yeah. you can build. Here's a whole Hogwarts or Star Wars or uh, New York skyline, Chicago skyline, whatever you want to build. I'm giving you all those. Now make make with it what you will. Most deaf, man. And one thing I've always wondered when it came to auditions and bringing characters to life is how much of it is um, just you bringing the life what that person already has in their head versus you bringing something that makes them even question what they thought about the character. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, no, I think I, I get you know, I get you know what, what I mean? mean. Like, like yeah. sometimes an actor will do some shit and they're like, wait, hold up. That's true to the character, but I didn't even think about that. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. um, there was a, but, um, I can, oh, please go ahead. You no, no, that. please. Uh, there was actually a role that I played in the, short film that hasn't come out yet but it will soon shout out to my boy james um that wrote it and directed it. it's called flushing it's based in queens and um the way in which i even got this role was i found it on i found it on twitter that he was like yo if there's anybody in new york that wants to audition for a role and i saw it and i was like you know what i'll just hit him up and i'm gonna audition yeah. for it and when i sent the audition um they had already i feel really bad for this still to this day they had already cast somebody Man. but when they saw my audition tape, they were like, "Oh shit, <laughs> uh, yeah. we gotta, we gotta, we, we gotta get Melvin on board." 
So I felt bad, but then I got to meet the dude, and he was like, "Yeah, he was like, it's it's all good." And I was like, "All right, cool. As long as as long as we good there, because he was still part of the the team in some way." But um, they originally wrote that character for somebody that wasn't black, and a lot mm-hmm. of that film deals with kind of the the changing of New York and how many transplants such as myself or such as other people from different cultures come to New York and what's happening with how much is changing, how people are getting pushed out, housing, so on and so forth. And they do that through a lens of fashion. And when I was delivering, there's a monologue where I'm going back and forth with the main character because I was supporting him. There's a monologue where we're going back and forth and I'm talking about how much of New York is changing. And, uh, the I remember him after we shot that scene, um, he was like, I never thought about it from an aspect of like he wrote it, but he because he never saw a black person saying it, it felt different when he was like, This is a whole nother world that everything is going on in Harlem, everything that's happening in yeah. Brooklyn right now, and what's I he didn't even imagine that being a part of it until he saw me deliver it and was yep. like, I want to go back can we redo this let me change a couple things to fit it exactly it changes the whole scope and the whole relationship that me and the main character had so he had to go back and redo a couple other things that we were going to shoot later but um it's it's really cool to be able to get that feeling um because it's like i'm I'm bringing a sense of self-worth and confidence and uh i guess you could say freshness to this character that they've had in their head for so long. Yeah. Um, so it's really cool when it does happen. I won't say that it happens often, but when it does, it's awesome because people are like, yo, that was great. Now can we do it again? So, yeah. yeah, man, that's exceptional. It must be very gratifying because, um, like you said, I'm sure it doesn't happen too often. And it's you're, you're adding new layers to a character mm-hmm. that someone created in their mind and it's pushing them. And there's always... A bit of magic in a process that pushes everybody yeah. to get outside their comfort zone and outside what they were thinking um, originally. So, man, this would probably be the, uh, I mean, unless we, we stumble on something else, this would probably be the last question about acting because mm-hmm. there's, there's a couple other things I want to get into okay. um, as far as your career and, and uh, your interests, your passions. But, man, in terms of your past film experiences, obviously there's one. You know, uh, our mutual friend, shout out Rodney Brown. Shout out him you know and as well shout as Brittany. Yeah. I was about to say shout out Brittany as well. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Like two of the best, um, you know, director, producer, creators, writers in the game. Yep. Um, you know, Talk just putting on from the DMV, mm-hmm. um, you know, made their home in Brooklyn. Um, so, man, I wanted to know just about that experience of shooting that film mm-hmm. and like what that experience taught you to take forward. Uh, great question. Um, the experience shooting it, hell, the experience getting up to the point of shooting it was crazy because we all met on the same day. Um, and I remember it was like some months after yeah. that I was just sitting on the couch in my living room and I was like, I remember that dude Rodney said that he was doing, he was going to do a short. Let me just check in to see if, you know, what's going on with it, if they already shot it, then whatever the case. And when I hit him, he was like, we actually doing auditions right now. Can you come like tomorrow and i was like uh what uh uh yeah sure i guess actually come today huh uh okay um (laughs) but (laughs) yeah yeah but it was it was good it was good like we went in and um did a great job and uh we were able to build a a sense of um relatability and a sense of like uh of of knowing that we were like okay we're on the same page and they both are just so great at being able to tell stories that are so natural to life and that people feel and experience because we'll watch a lot of stories we'll watch a lot of movies that we look sometimes we like that ain't gonna happen in real life like we we know or somebody will like somebody will tell a joke and then they mean ah, ha, ha, like immediately and it's like bro like you didn't even give them time to finish getting yeah, a joke out, bro. Right, right. chill and <laughs> they're both so good at being able to just layer things from a top level like okay this is what i'm seeing but then as you start to peel it back really get into the emotionality and the mental aspect of things that people um, only really talk about and deal with behind closed doors and being able to have the conversations about what um, the character Elijah and his then girlfriend and then ex-girlfriend Corinne were going through and how they were feeling and what point in times in their life they were where they were like you know two ships that were along together but then at a certain point you know they're they're going their opposite ways and why 
these things started to happen. They just, um, going back to that backstory part, they were able to build such a great foundation that it wasn't even difficult for me to get into character that much. Now, some of that was also due to me having similar experiences that that, right. uh, that, that character went through. But just from them being able to build a world that was like, you can just go into it and just live in it, it just opened, opened the floodgates. And, um, you know, I, I took away so much in terms of just how to put together a solid team, how to make a good script, um, how to run a smooth day, um, how to just have good people around you in this business, because sometimes it can be very difficult, mm. and um, how uh, an idea can come from, you know, something that they came up with and nurtured all the way into um, the field circuits and then eventually on BT Plus and Hulu and Revolt TV and so on and so forth. So it was a, a super amazing transformative experience for me and I will always big them up and always talk about them because they, they truly set the bar in terms of where things were going and I believe that they'll both be uber successful moving on. Yeah, man. I, I can't wait to see what they do. For real, um, they they got some things cooking right now that yeah. it's 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 gonna be when y'all see it when y'all let me say that when y'all hear about what they're doing then y'all gonna be like whoa wait a minute it's they they always working on something and it's gonna be great I promise y'all that yeah man it's gonna be incredible mm -hmm. it's so incredible I'm mm -hmm. proud of them um so yeah man pivoting um, away from acting mm -hmm. um a bit um you know as you can tell like Mel's very much so a natural on camera you know what I'm saying. A natural yeah, in terms of his voice, his personality. Yeah, the amount of YouTube and, videos I did, I better be a natural on camera at this because, point. <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. what I'm saying. So because of all of his experience doing broadcasting, YouTube, comedy, sketches, etc. Mm -hmm. So you got your um you were you what you alluded to earlier was that you got your start um kind of in entertainment and media, like doing uh broadcast work and like doing yeah. uh Lakers Nation uh work, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Man. For the, the best team in the universe. Come on, talk about you know it. What I'm saying? Talk about well, it. Just, just for all you Lakers Nation out there, we got to shout y'all out too. Come on, you know what it um, is. So, man, could you talk about uh, just your experience being in broadcasting, being a personality, and mm -hmm. um, how that's grown you as a man? Uh, good question. I don't think I've ever been asked that. Um, how it's grown me as a man, I will say that it's just allowed me to be open to change. And the way in which I'll phrase that or um, the perspective that I'll give you on that is that in sports, you know, we get new news every day, right? Yeah. You're getting something new that comes on your phone, a tweet somebody sends or somebody said this or somebody said that or a new video or whatever the case may be. And um, in terms of how that relates to me as a man, it's just that, well, if I'm always intaking this new information, but I'm not at least adjusting my perspective or adjusting the way I see things through it, then what am I doing? I'm just, I'm shutting myself off from whatever new comes in that I'm not going to be able to grow. Yeah. I'm always going to be the same person that I am. So that's how I would say that helped me to shape who I am today mm -hmm. and just the, me being so open to, okay, I may know one thing right now, but something new may happen and that may change. Like oh, at one that? point in time, yeah. I may have said, this is the best player. And now I'm like, you know what, based on what I'm seeing, and what I now know, this may be the guy, or this may be the best team, and now this may be the best team. And being able to have that outlook in sports, but also in life, just opens you up to so many more possibilities rather than just staying rigid in um, what it is that you are and who it is that you are. But um, Things can change so my, fast. So, so fast. So, so fast. But yeah. my experience in um, sports journalism in general started with um, just kind of, it started out of that depression that I went through when I stopped playing sports. Mm -hmm. Because like I mentioned earlier, I was like reading, 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 and then sports took over. Sports was my life from like fourth grade all the way until my sophomore year of college. So like almost damn near all of my life, that's all I was concerned about. All I ever, like I eat, slept, like everything was, was sports. And this was back in the days when you had to look up like mixtapes on youtube to you, kobe bryant mixtape or the paul pierce or the tracy mcgrady or whatever the case may be mixtape yeah, and before exactly. they was just like the highlight mixes that the nba and whatnot have like yeah. no it was just solo creators back in the day Yo, making those themselves the best, and man just like going through all of that but um the the depression that i went through when i stopped playing which is something that i hope i can turn into something one day is it was it was really rough because i was like similar to with my hair this is how I identify myself in the world. Yeah. 
now that I'm not going to be who I thought I was going to be, or I'm not going to do what I thought I was going to do, what am I going to do now? And then I was like, okay, well, I can still be around it because I, I looked at it after some time. I was like, I know everybody that's in the sports department. Like I know everybody on all the teams. I know all the coaches. I know the janitors. Like I, I love talking about it. And at the time, that was when you know Skip Bayless and was really kind of like is hitting the public lexicon of things. Yeah. And you would have some people that would kind of be like, "Well, I'm gonna start to be that way here to kind of get that same kind of thing." And I never wanted to be that guy. Right. Like what everybody's doing now with the athletes having their own platforms and talking to people. That's what I wanted to be back then was, well, look, I know it was a rough game because I understand like what the defense was doing and how they wanted to make it difficult for you specifically so that you couldn't get into your spots. So what did they do to make it more difficult for you or was it that you weren't able to do rather than coming out and being like, yo, you had a terrible game. Tell me why. <laughs> right, right. Like you played terrible. And it was just like, yo, you yeah. really going to ask him? Right, that right. question, like, do you did you see the zone defense that they played be to be able to exactly and and have some type of nuance to your question? Just that, a little that bit that shows your understanding of the game instead of you just trying to get a hot take. Exactly, yeah, yeah. and with me doing that and people seeing that I was coming at it from, look, I want to tell this story, mm -hmm. but I don't want to make you look bad. Now, if the stats yeah. make you look bad, then that's not on me. Right. But I want to be able to shine you in a positive light. And as long as you exactly, as long as you know that that's the position I'm coming from, and as long as the athlete knows that that, that was the position I'm coming from, they're more, more often than not they were going to be more open with me about things and more honest about things. And I would probably end up getting more information than what I originally needed, and maybe that I could use for a follow up story or a subsequent story, or uh, maybe even get some laughs that might help to get some more circulation. And um, I was doing all of that. And while I was on old Twitter, um, I'm not calling it X, but when I was on yeah, Twitter yeah. Uh, back then, uh, I was like, you know what? I, you know, huge Lakers fan. There was this opportunity that came across my desk to be able to write for Lakers Nation and Lakers Nation and Lakers Nation. I was actually writing for two at the same time. And I was like, you know what? Let me see if I can make it happen. And um, it, it ended up happening so much so that I was like, um, I was in the, uh, the student senate and uh one day we had a meeting that i had to leave to go do a radio interview um i had to go find an office to do a radio interview with the radio station down in tampa and what i didn't know afterwards is that everybody else in the senate knew that i had to do the meeting yeah. so they when i left they paused the meeting and turned it on so that way they were listening to me Yo, as i was so talking dope, about bro. it and then i came back and they gave me a stand ovation i was like what are y'all <laughs> clapping for i just had a phone call and it's like no we were listening and i was like what hey, i ain't tell nobody how did y'all know but yeah, um, so dope, bro. it was really cool. Thank you, man. Thank you. And it was I was trying to get to the point of being able to do that with video mm -hmm. as well. But uh, we just didn't have access to the type of cameras and I didn't have like the right microphones. And I also didn't have a team of people together to be able to pull it off in the way that people are doing it now. Because I was like, oh, I got the idea. Like, yeah. we just need to make this. Happen. I the know resources. it can be big. Yeah. And it just it just wasn't it just wasn't time for it. You had a good time with it, though. Just a little bit, you know just saying? a little bit. But uh, it was it was awesome, nonetheless. It was a good time, and um, yeah, I, I loved it. I was writing for the school newspaper, the local newspaper, Lakers Nation, Laker Nation, and a couple other places um, until I got back to New York and started writing for uh, Respect Magazine, and then eventually Heavy dot com. And yeah, man, as someone who also has a journalism background, and I was very reluctant to get into journalism. You know what I'm saying? I, I think everyone has um, ways that they intersect and that they're uh, and they overlap and they're connected to people who come into their life, you know, and they work with, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like one of the things that I've um, connected with you over is the fact that I didn't really want to do journalism at first. Like I was a mm -hmm. ball player, yeah. You know what I'm saying? I only did journalism because one of my teachers was very, you know, she was persistent. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And yeah. um, I always thank her for that because it changed the course of my life in terms of just what I was exposing myself to and just my attitude towards exposing myself to new things, right? Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, being a kid from Trenton, like, I didn't want to be in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. So the storytelling that you got from being a broadcast journalist mm -hmm. and from writing for Lakers Nation, um, how does that, how did that prepare you to tell stories in the ways that you told um, afterwards on your own platforms and 
uh, even today as an actor? Uh, good question. I would say that what it helped me to do is, and what I had a difficult time doing early on, was one, finding my own structure for what worked for me. Because I was when I was early in trying to write mm. really good stories, um, I was just following like, okay, well, uh, this person got X amount of views or had mm. like somebody, I heard somebody say that they had a good story. So let me try and write it in their voice or how they would do it. And they were just trash. It was just really, really bad, like articles. Yeah. And to the point where yeah, one of the, it, right, right, because it wasn't me, to the point where one of the editors was like, Bro, like we we might not be able to have you here if you keep doing this. Like you gotta you gotta get this together. So I was like, I I okay. So I just had to really like hone in and get with some folks that I knew to really find like, okay, well, what do I want to say? Like, what do I want to say about this topic? What's the perspective that I want to have? What's the story that I want to tell? What's the story that I want to explain to the audience that they might not know about? And that's what ended up taking me through everything else that um, I'm doing now. That's the same um, formula that I use for when I was writing, mm. that I use for when I was doing radio, that I use for YouTube, and almost what I'm doing for Baldy right now. Let me tell the stories that people aren't really talking about that has some nuance and some depth and some meat to it, so that way I can give something to somebody that they didn't even know that they need. Mm. Incredible, man. I'm just meditating on what you said about giving somebody yeah, something yeah, that they didn't even know they came for. Like exactly. That, it's it's that, it's a uh, it's a really cool thing to be able to see what everybody else sees, obviously, but it's even doper to be able to look at it and say, All right, well, what what's missing? Mm-hmm. And how can I add my spin on things from there? Like even with like uh my YouTube reactions, um, which you know, people will look at it and be like, Yo, it's just like you just reacting to music and stuff off of YouTube, but uh, music or movie trailers off of YouTube, but coming from somebody that worked in music yeah. um, and also that worked in film and TV to a degree and that was acting like the same way that I'm like, do you understand the character that this person is trying to build? Those are things that I would talk about in my trailers. Yeah. And the same with music and from like when I was singing or when I used to play piano when I was little and when I would hear certain notes or even... Yeah. Um, like when I uh, I, I did well reaction for um, can you feel the love today with Beyonce and Donald Glover <laughs> and just from like the moment that the song came on and and you know we heard Donald and everybody else and Billy Eichner and Seth Rogen's voice shout out to Billy Eichner he's a really good cool dude um, when I was able to hear their voices I was like oh okay like yo they sound good but when Beyonce came on it was different I was like. Hold on. <laughs> Everybody else sound like they a country mile from the microphone and she sounds like she's here. Yeah. So then that got me into my, well, what kind of microphone is she using? But at the same time, this is how good her voice is, is that everybody could be using the same kind, but she sounds like this. And then her engineer might be doing this or the producers might be doing this and so on and so forth. While most people are just like, damn, that's crazy. She sounds really good. Okay, let's go. So, you you're, know? so based upon your experiences, your knowledge, you're extracting something different from the same thing that someone else is seeing. Exactly. And that's where the value comes from. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's your value prop is that by listening to this with my ears, just based upon uh, the experience I have with music, the knowledge I have of music, and then also like being someone who's an actor and has written and has experienced being on set and mm-hmm. um, character building, I see what they're doing here in a way that... Um, Maybe your naked eye wouldn't see. Exactly. It's it almost identical. And that's why I said it's the same formula that I am that I used in college when I was mm-hmm. telling the stories of the athletes and being like, y'all may see it this way, but based on my experience and having been there to a degree with some of them, mm-hmm. then I'm seeing it this way. And let me just tell you a little bit more about that because that's going to inform what it is that you thought. And now if what I'm also giving you and the new news that you're getting, you're not adjusting your perspective, well, then you're just going to stay the same person yeah. and be stay exactly where you are. Oh, Meanwhile, sure. I'm going to continue to evolve as a person overall because I'm going to intake this new information and yeah. use it to make me better. Man, that's why I love, like you talked about earlier, the athletes having their own platforms now. Mm-hmm. And I love the fact that there's also um, people who are on the other end of the spectrum who are like stats nerds and they just go off the numbers. Mm-hmm. I think we just need both to have balance 
Agreed. And um, I also appreciate people who have a good mix of both. Like in boxing, like your Andre Ward, mm -hmm. he knows the numbers, but he also has been a world champion, Olympic gold medalist, undefeated boxer, but he's also studied um, the stats in, enough to have uh, that argument. So, you know what I'm saying? I, I believe that just adds a whole different layer of perspective to the game. Yeah. Um, it's it's a similar way in which uh, one of my favorite all-time boxers is uh, Roy Jones Jr. Yeah. And I felt like he was able to kill it in that same way of when he was younger, he was so textbook and by the book just about like with his fundamentals. But as he got a little bit older and really got into his athleticism as who he was as a person, mm -hmm. he was able to marry both of, here's what I know about the sweet science, but here's what I can do naturally. Yeah. And that's where you got who he ended up being. And yeah. it was just, it was just, I wish he would have retired so he could have been <laughs> the, the goal or yeah. even the, the one fight that, you know, obviously him and Mike Tyson um, fought, you know, a couple of years ago, but nobody yeah, really right knows. Tarver, What's funny and what I'm going to get to is that that Tarver fight, originally he was supposed to have the Mike fight then because Mike was coming back. Yeah. And not a lot of people know that. Right. And it was just like, how much of that changed the course? Man. How much? Oh my goodness! He, he probably beats that version he, of Mike. He do, and now he could have been like, "I'm done." Right. And then we talking about him as like, "Is the goal. like, yeah. yo, uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, Roy Jones Jr." That's yeah. what we're up that's, there with that's Sugar the, Ray Robinson. Exactly. Like, that would be them three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But yeah, still Roy Jones, talent wise, man, he's the most talented boxer I've ever seen. It's just incredible. his natural ability, his reflexes, um, bro, and also his killer instinct isn't talked about too much. You know what I'm saying? Like, if he had a guy hurt, he's usually getting him up he's out of going, Yo, quick and easy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, quick and easy. He's incredible like, athlete. oh, you, he going to look at the ref. Are we ending this right now, or do I got to end it? Okay, cool. <laughs> right, Over right. with. Over with. Bye-bye. <laughs> right. bye. Don't make me start putting on the show, because yeah. when that boy started having fun with it, it was Bruh. a wrap. He started having so much fun, he was like, I'm going to go play Pro-Am games. Right. Like, I'm playing against Matt Barnes in NBA Summer League games before my fight. <laughs> and not to mention, I'm yeah. signed to Jordan, and I got a hit single out. Right now, because y'all must have forgot. And I was like, "Yo, this is this is crazy." He's different, but bro. yeah, he's, he's, it's so different. Just different, man. So, man, two more questions I have for you. Mm -hmm. uh, one of these is, uh, it's, it's, I love to just get people's influences, um, and also to see how they've changed over time, right? So, when you were growing up, which actors and personalities were your influences, and mm -hmm. who is it now? Um. Good question. What's crazy is as I was growing up, um, and it was kind of hard for me, I really had to lean on some of my friends and even some of my family at this point in time. Um, after these experiences happened, the main, some of the main people that I was really looking at from high school and college were Stuart Scott, Kobe Bryant, Nipsey Hussle. Hmm. And then I, I knew about Chadwick Boseman from uh, some stuff that he was doing around here before he got really big. Mm. And then it was it was tough because I was like, these are people that one day I'm going to work with and blah, blah, blah. And then obviously, you know, what's yeah. happened has now happened. And it was really difficult because I was just like, these are all the people that I'm like supremely looking up to that are just all gone. But mm -hmm. aside from them, um, there's also like, of, of course, Will Smith and uh, Michael Jordan and Denzel Washington, but there are other people like uh, a lot of people don't know. John H. Johnson was somebody that I knew about back then that started Ebony and Jet Magazine and Johnson um, Publishing or uh, Reginald F. Lewis, who owned the Beaches Company, who mm -hmm. was like one of the first uh, one of the first black people to own a billion dollar company um, at that point in time. And then being from Chicago, you know, everybody at one point in time looked up to Oprah because she out here giving everybody, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car, everybody gets a car. <laughs> yeah, and who yeah. don't want to be like, yo, I want to be like that when I get older. <laughs> like, I can just give people cars right, like right. or houses. Like, what do you what do you mean? No, nah, Oprah, um, Oprah's different. Yeah, Oprah was Oprah was so, so, so different. But um, yeah, them and then like at least musical, um, musically, you know, I, I mentioned Nipsey, but um, some really big influences on me were uh, Childish Gambino, Donald Glover. Um, Fit Crit has been a huge um, influence Bro, on just Crit being able to talk about. He don't at all. Why yeah, did bro. nobody talk about Mount Olympus after the control 
uh, verse from Kendrick came out because that was his response, yeah, and that was that. the best response right. anybody had. But nobody talks about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was like hard to have an answer for control just because of what it was. Yep. Because everybody was trying to do it how Kendrick did it. Yeah. And Crip was like, I'm going to do it how I'm going to do it. And yes. I was like, why is nobody talking about this? <laughs> but, nah, Crip's um, way too nice. Like, to me, Catalactica, bro, top 50 hip hop album of all time for me. Oh, God, Classic, so joint, bro. Even the single itself, I'm oh, still, bro. one day I want to do. Uh, he Apparently, he tried to get a deal with Cadillac. And they were like, no, at that point in time. And now they, they're, they're out here right. doing stuff with, they 100% did. They're out here doing stuff with uh, different hip-hop groups and different influencers and stuff now. But I, one of my goals is to be in something one day where my character drives a Cadillac. And I want to play the shit out of Cadillac as I'm doing it. You as a way it, to be like, Crit, I got you, bro. <laughs> I got you. Like, you're <laughs> our, you are my guy. Um Another huge influence I had was J. Cole. He's one of the reasons that I even fully decided to uh, come to New York. Him and, funny enough, Michael B. Jordan. And um, mm. the fact was that if J. Cole moved here and ended up meeting um, Jay-Z, then who's to say that I can't come here? And at the time, I went from broadcast journalism to, oh, I'm going to be a host. Well, who's doing it? Ryan Seacrest and Nick Cannon are both in New York all the time. And so is Terrence J. That's where I need to be because mm-hmm. I'll meet one of them. And I met two out of the three and uh, had some really good productive almost work together conversations. But um, yeah, it was it was it was it was, it was crazy. Them. Those would be my people. And then the last one that I'll say for right now would also be Michael B. Jordan in the sense that I watched that awkward moment like literally months before, uh, like a month before I got the uh, interview to come here to New York. And I remember saying to myself, like, man, like, I would love to have like kind of live a life like that in New York City but also I would love to act in something like that one day and lo and behold this is what we're doing now so there you go man full circle with it very much so yeah bro I love to see that man I love to see also people meet uh people who they look up to or get to work with them and they don't disappoint them yeah you know I love I love to see that um those stories aren't always shared Mm -hmm. so man the last question of the interview to me is one of the most important okay Oh boy, here we go. Let me get ready. As a Kobe fan, do you identify with eight or twenty-four the most? Damn, that's a, that's oh god. Do I identify with eight or twenty-four the most? Twenty-four. What? I identify with twenty-four the most because that's where the real work was put in. Because before LeBron started, decided I'm gonna break every record for being older. Um, yeah, yeah. Kobe was doing that in a way in which we hadn't seen before, especially for how different the NBA was at that point in time. It wasn't as like run and gun as it is now. It was still very much half court offense. And it was like very much half court offense, but transitioning to what we're in right now. And it's easier to, you know, I'm gonna just drop in and play that way. And that's why I give LeBron so much credit is that he was in that it's half court offense and mm-hmm. now is in this it's run and gun three point offense but able to succeed in both in right and it's been exactly he's been able to continually be a top three arguably number one greatest of all time player throughout all of that right and with Kobe it was so much of I'm going to put the work in to stay as good as I have been or even I'm going to come back from this Achilles injury and be as good as I can be and then the nickname of Black Mamba came out of that, and I was like, "Ooh, that's fire!" Yeah. And then he had Vino Vino. for a little. Come on, I had a shirt. Yeah, they just sent me a shirt with Vino on it. I was like, "Oh my yeah, god!" That was the season you were working. Yes, on, yes, it was. Yo, it was. So was. It was. Bro. I was um, underrated. Kobe season. Man, he was it, going crazy. He was going. It was, that was at the time where it was like nobody at this age has ever done this, and it was it was insane. I firmly believe if he, you know, they, I don't think they would have won the championship, but I think that they would have had very deep playoff run and probably could have brought that whole unit back if it didn't end the way in which it did and really had a real run at it. But um, 24 is who I identify with the most just because that's where I got that work ethic from. Because not to say that I didn't see that in 8, but 8 had so much early success from one, putting the work in, but two, just being so athletically gifted at that point in time and marrying them that it was like, only a certain amount of people can do that. Right. And while he still had some of that at 24, that's where he got into the nuts and bolts of what's textbook. Right. What do Still I need set. to do? 
What's yeah. my yeah? What's gonna be my routine? How am I gonna make myself? How am I gonna separate myself from everybody yeah. from a technical standpoint? And that's why I was like, that's that to me is the the that's always my number one. I tell people all the time. I think Michael Jordan is the greatest of all time. I think LeBron James is the best of all time. But if you ask me who I'm picking, gun to my head, I'm picking Kobe because yeah. I feel like he's gonna get the best of both of them. I think he could beat them both one on one. Hands down. For sure. Hands for down. sure. Look, man, that's a perfect place to end it, bro. Again, man, wanna thank you for coming on the Black Soul Media, bro. Thank you, man. I'm so happy we got this joint done, bro. Like, um, I've just watched your journey, just watched, like I said, your incredible work ethic, um, your attention to detail. You've always been someone who's uh very steady and um always shows up the same way. And um I think I speak for a lot of people, probably your loved ones, your fans as well, when I say it means a lot to have people like that who always show up the same way. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So uh, thanks for being great, man, for doing what you do, bro. And I know this is only the beginning for you. I know you probably got even more announcements coming your way. Thank and, you, man. Um, you know, blessings, bro. So thanks again. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thank you for having this platform, allowing me to come on this platform so that way we can have more of our stories be told and you can share more stories from the guests that you have. Congratulations on crossing 50 subscribers on youtube because that is a hard thing to do i know bro i know, bro. Know, I bro. know man it's, it's a people who are like well Melvin, you got so many now and i'm like y'all don't understand the work that went in to get those first 10. <laughs> do you know how hard that really is like and then to let alone the, the first 50 to hunt stop it it's people don't understand so you to to be able to commit to doing that but also releasing this on other platforms and pumping these stories out so that way people can have uh, different perspectives on the businesses that folks are doing and the psyches that they have and how they're going about it and just providing uh, a range for people to be able to look at things in a different lens. It's it's incredible. I appreciate you. And I'm, I'm super excited for you to continue on and make Black Soul Media as big as you can. Appreciate you, man. And we'll see you again for the next episode of Black Soul Media. And uh, thanks for tuning into this one. We out.